welcome back to another episode of Vancouver Real. My name is Mike Zaremba, and I'm always here with my big brother, Andy. Hey, everybody. I'm stoked. Back-to-back episodes. Yeah. Well, yeah. we're going to release them a little staggered, but even still, yeah, we just did one yesterday, and we don't do them back-to-back too often, but it feels kind of cool. But we have a special guest today. Um, but I'm very first, excited about this guest. Yeah, this is going to be a fun well, one. Thanks, guys. I am. <laughs> We've been trying to make this happen for so long. We now. have, yeah. yeah. It's been in the works. Um, Sorry, I interrupted your flow. No, it's all good. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to address two podcasts ago. I said I wanted to talk a little bit about the Coast Salish people and their nations and their territories because this this past summer, Vancouver uh, as a city recognized that um, this is unceded Coast Salish uh, land. And, um, you know, it doesn't really make much of an impact uh, because the provincial level and the federal level of government still hasn't really come to that recognition or understanding, but at least the city's kind of like said that. And so, so what, what does that mean exactly? Basically what it means is that on any formal like um, uh, city hosting or welcoming of like a ambassador of some sort, or they'll always recognize the Coast Salish territory people um, within like that formal setting of the cities, whatever they're doing. So but, it's just but, a recognition But I'm saying thing. like, does it mean that they actually, like, the city is actually still owned by them, the land that it's on technically? Is that what it means? Um, well, the city is, is owned by like the province slash the federal government. Okay. So, you know, it's still, this land is, I think, I don't know, but I just read one article today of, in the Metro from like But now June. they're basically always recognizing it. Um, yes, exactly. Huh. So it's kind of like a respect thing. And, yeah. the, and the three uh, nations of people are the Squamish people, the Saleh Watuth people, and the Musqueam people, and uh, those like nations. And all the, the highest members of those nations, the chiefs, they yep. uh, are like cool with it. They're like, yes, that's, that's a very, they're like, take they're it as a, that. they're happy they're with the recognition. It's like, it's a good step, they say, yeah, yeah. kind of thing. So that's it's a good. positive thing. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Um, so there we go. I did. I did what I said I was going to do. That's why I did that. But uh, let's move on to well, bigger and better things. No, like it's broadcasting not out of Float House, right? Vancouver's. I can't say exclusive, but we can say original Float Center, right? Located down in Gastown and Kitsilano in Victoria. We have three centers, <coughs> and if you use the promo some, code <coughs> Recovery, you can get twenty percent off a single float. And uh, go to www.floathouse.ca and you can redeem that there. Cool. <coughs> As I choke on my water. <laughs> I'll put the camera on you so yeah. everyone can see that. Yeah, it's a little uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Mike can take a breath and I can try no. to speak for once. You um, don't need to fill the void. It's okay. Okay, yeah. You can let these pauses happen. <laughs> it's okay. It's be right. natural. So um, uh, yes. today we have with us a good friend of ours. We go back. Back to the days of McMaster University. Yeah. Yeah. Jesse College. Lumston. And he is our old roommate slash teammate. Yep. Yep. And uh, currently he participated in the last two Olympic Games. Yep. Team Canada Bob Sledding. Also a float ambassador for the float house. Boom. The first there. float ambassador. The first official float ambassador. That's yep. this is Which was an honor to be a part of that with you guys. Hey man. You, you, were the f- you didn't hesitate. You didn't blink. And this was before we even opened. We're like, you know, this is back when people were calling it the float thing. The float thing. And like, oh, God. You know, annoying. how's the float thing going? How's the float thing going? Yeah. And we're like, it's going good. It's going good. Yeah, it's coming along. Yeah. It's coming along. And then uh, anyways, but uh, we told you about this ambassador program we wanted to run. Mm-hmm. And you didn't blink. You just like, yeah, absolutely. 100%. I'm well, there. I mean, it, it doesn't matter what you guys are going to be getting into, you know, it's about s- surrounding yourself with the good people yeah, but and, yeah. and, and definitely I'd, I'd be, I'd be back in anything. Well, just about anything you guys are doing pretty together. Much. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty good. We keep it pretty kosher. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're white lights, we're, we're white lights, but there, you know, there's some, there's some controversial psychedelia use in there that we might get criticized for from time to time. Yeah. Nah. But, yeah, that's, no. that's 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 gonna be growth. Main, give that five years. That's the main stream. Five years, yeah, we'll yeah. be there. Do um, that with maps. And just to get it off the cuff, Jesse Lumsden is on Facebook and on Twitter at Jesse Lumsden twenty eight uh, at Jesse Lumsden twenty eight, yep. and that is spelled J E S S E L U M S D E N. And um, yeah, so just kind of some background from from my side too. Jesse was uh, a 
our teammate. I lived with you for two years in university. We played lots of sports together. Mm -hmm. um, you. Um, those are fun days. Those are fun days. <laughs> oh yeah. my gosh! So I we played football uh, at Mac. We were recruited in the same year at we high were, school. Yeah. Played against each other in high school as That's well, right. too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you guys won. Lord yeah. Nelson. It was exhibition. It was exhibition. It was a good game, actually. Yeah, it was a good game. It was game. a relatively close back and forth. It was a good yeah. battle of very two top high school football teams within the GTA, yeah. which was fun. So, um, and went we, on to university, and you had an amazing career at McMaster as a running back, playing football there. It was, like, such a special thing to... Um, to watch you play, man, it was really cool. Like you were one of the top, if not the top running backs of, of all time. It's debatable. You're in the top three for sure, I think. Five, 10, I don't know, whatever, but. Well, I appreciate that, that's yeah, nice. And, I, uh, I still we did, tell it, we people, did it together. Oh, well, I still tell people to this day, one of my most favorite plays that I've ever seen like my own playing career was Queens, 2003, it was their home opener. I think it was their homecoming to you. Was it yeah. their homecoming that year? I think it was homecoming. Not homecoming. homecoming. And we were we were down. Like it was we were we had basically lost the game. And we were down by I think a touchdown, right? Seven points? Yep. Yeah. And there was twenty eight seconds left in the clock. And of course, number twenty eight was sitting there at the back ready to receive the ball. Yeah. And then all we hear is Marshall just yell, Return it <laughs> <laughs> Yep. And sure enough, Jesse takes it the full length of the field cuts diagonally across the field and it was it was strange because it was like you you had like this speed that was kind of unseen before like guys were just like missing you it was like they were mistiming their angles or something they were just like missing you and you cut across the field and you took it all the way into the end zone and boom tied it up then we went into the shootout yeah the d stopped them and then we got on the offense and i think we kicked the field goal i was think we field kicked goal? the field goal yeah. yeah and we won it so it was in the shootout so it was pretty awesome it was one of the craziest athletic feats that I witnessed firsthand. Yeah. Like it was what? insane. Well, what do you say to that? Yeah, I I, <laughs> I kind of remember it vaguely. <laughs> well, how can you remember that, though? I it remember, must have been so intense. I remember you or Ford afterwards came up and grabbed me and <laughs> picked me up and started shaking me. And I'm like, I, I, put me down. I think it was Postma because post -ma. I wasn't on kick return either with Ford. It was on the sidelines, though. Oh, it was on the sidelines. I can't remember. Okay. That was fun. We had a lot of good times. I time remember, stuff. I think Postma was telling me that uh, he, he caught up with you in the end zone and he said you were so gassed oh, and you yeah. couldn't even talk. Yeah. And you were just like, are there any flags? You're yelling, are That's there any right. flags? And he's like, no. I remember that now. Man, yeah. we had a lot of fun together. And we were all on the offense. And, uh, yeah. I mean, a big part of, a big part of um, what, personally, what I was able to do is what we, we, what we were able to do together. For and sure. then, And what we were able to do together. Yeah. It's... The ultimate team sport. Oh, dude, yeah, no, oh, it's, yeah, for sure. Well, you, I mean, you had a great analogy too, and it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the closest sport to like simulated warfare. Oh you yeah, know, like mm -hmm. you're actually on a field that's gridded off its territory. You're trying to score and take territory back, and yep. you know, you have all these specialized positions and these specialized athletes that do these tasks, sure. and you have these coordinators and generals, and you have these plays, and you know, yeah. you plan and practice, and uh, you know. So the bond you get with the team like that, and you go through training camp, and it's hot, and you train in the off season, and that, like, and also like the the rituals you go in, like before game time, yeah, like right. you put your stuff on the same way, you listen to the same music, you this know, guy, you just gotta put my jersey on before every game, dude. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Put my jersey on yeah, before every cool. game. The bagpipes were playing that, when we get to the stadium. I love the pipes. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. You go out there in the pipes. I just go like out there and like listen to them walk bagpipes. around the field. Yep. Oh man, it get me pumped up. Yeah. And it's no, always it's like the same thing. It was always, I always used to do this weird little thing. I used to, uh, when we used to run out on the field, I always just wanted to be like the third or fourth guy in. Uh -huh. So as soon as they start running out, that's when the crowd starts yelling. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. so as soon as I get out there, they start yelling. I'm like, yeah. Right, because there's a little delayed reaction. Exactly. Right? So right. I was always like the third or fourth guy in, so I could hear the crowd roar as I went out. So it's kind of get me to more pumped To shoot you up. out. Very yeah, gladiator-like exactly. of you. Yeah. yeah. And then I'd always run up to the goalpost and start like, Punching it, basically. <laughs> <laughs> not punching it, you know, the offensive line style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, but uh, was, so that's what I was. My was magic you going <laughs> to like a big heavy bag. Well, no, maybe now, but not not then. Yeah. I, was, I was, you know, thinking technique. Get your technique yeah. right, and then I'd go into the end zone and start doing some like little takeoffs and sprints and getting fired up. And cool. It's, it's just fun those like little pre-game rituals and that for sure. Too, right? It's like you literally. It's like your own sense. You're kind of preparing for battle in a way. 
it is physical. It is a battle. It's not a battle in the modern sense of war or f- fighting, or but it is a battle. The, the physicality of football, especially in uh, the O line and D line, you're nose to nose with a guy for three hours, hitting them and the guy beside him constantly. That's a constant battle for position and yeah. territory, like you're talking yeah. about. And yeah. you know, the cool thing is, at the end of the day, you always know. Like with the guy you're squared up against, mostly you know who came out better that day. Oh, for sure. You always know, you know, and uh, and, that you know, and you know you're gonna hear Marshall once or twice. For, for O line, is your like kind of defensive uh, counter opponent like the linebackers? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Like that next level. Yes, exactly. The second yeah. tier. Yeah. Athletically, they're very usually pretty Matched similar. Up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that was always the worst too when you you made a mistake, even if it didn't really affect the play that much. But you knew you fucked something up. For sure. I just sit there and be like, fuck, that's going to look bad in meetings. You know? And then you just. And you can never hide from film. Exactly. Oh, yeah. So you just sit there and you're like, God damn, that's going to look bad. Yeah. But then you're just like, fuck it, move on. Yeah, exactly. You know? And that's yeah. such a cool skill that it teaches you, too. So it's yeah. like you make a mistake. Well, don't sit there and dwell on that mistake. You can't sit there yeah. dwelling on that mistake yeah. or it's going to mess with your head. All these you other gotta, guys are relying on you to get, you get your head on. back in so the you game. You make a mistake. Okay, so you fucked up. Now you move on. And that's such a valuable skill for life. For sure. For anything. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. You just how to deal with failure, which Absolutely. is so important. Because, you know, most of us fail way more than we succeed. At least oh, I totally. Have, yeah. You yeah. Know? Oh, yeah. And uh, it takes I those failures and learning from failures to, to get somewhere. Really. Most successful people, I think, would agree with that as well. Yeah. It's You're going to get knocked down a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way she goes sometimes. Yeah. yeah. It's it's definitely. True, and that's, I mean, that's a good point for you. I mean, you went on from... Uh, university you had like you know super high expectations going mm-hmm. into pros and and then you know some bad luck with injuries and it's just it was a real adventure for you it really was but i mean talk about a very unique path and a very uh, unique set of experiences to receive in your life like i don't really know of any other um you know canadian university athlete that went through the NFL route that you did and then to the CFL and you know and just the whole experience was it was a very unique kind of thing you know yeah and I can only imagine it uh I don't know like gave you a pretty I don't know must have given you some really cool lessons for yeah absolutely I it's it's I mean going to Seattle to play for the Seahawks to try out for the Seahawks was probably one of the most uh exciting and intimidating parts yeah. you know things that I've experienced and totally uh, it wasn't until, and I worked my butt off, and I remember, I remember being in my hotel room and running out of paper one night and drawing plays on uh, the mirror with a, a thing of soap, wow. just so I could like study, um, and then in the end getting cut, and then, and then I realized after how the business side of it works, and that I realized, you know what, I was probably just a camp body to fill space and take some hits, but you learn from that, and mm-hmm. then when I did get cut I came up here and you were at UBC mm-hmm. um, spent some time with you and then and then went back and, and, and started finish, right. finish the season with that. Hamilton how long were you with me for like a week that's cool yeah, yeah I remember that yeah Man. and uh, so it, it definitely that that was that was big in how it my development as a football player but just more so understanding the business because yeah. you go from the level of CIS football in, in terms of a business compared to NCAA football, yeah, that is a huge leap oh, yeah. in itself. Sure. And then the yeah. NFL, which is probably very similar in terms of being on par with NCAA, in terms of the production, how much money those schools make based off of football with the Crazy. bowl games and all this jazz. And Nuts. Um, <laughs> to yeah. little CIS filling out 5,500 Les Prince totally. Stadium and yeah. I wouldn't change it for the world because that was awesome. Right, yeah. But uh, that was an eye-opener, that's for sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean, with the Canadian game, it's a very like just doing it for the love of the sport kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like it's there's something cool and same with the CFL. There's something cool that it's small. You know, that yeah. it's not this gigantic globalized league with I don't know, there's something neat about it because um, it, it is a unique game of its own. For sure. You know, yeah. Or uh, for Canada, and to be honest, if an exciting CFL game in my mind crushes an exciting NFL game. Well, because you get, you know, seventy-five percent of the games are going to be pretty exciting in the CFL. Yeah. Just because of the rules. Yeah. A game right. will never be over with three minutes left if there's if there's a difference in yeah. two scores. Yep, you're right. That's the, that's the cool thing about mm-hmm. CFL. Yeah, it's 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 made to be. It's made for that entertainment. And if you had that money yeah. and production value into the CFL, you're telling me that wouldn't be a bigger fan base than the NFL? Oh, sure. Come on. Sure. It's more exciting product. It's a better game. Yeah. 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 
it's more of a shootout, bigger field, especially with the athlete levels they have in the NFL. Yeah. They'd love to have that space, sure. man. Sure, absolutely. Are you kidding me? I agree 100%. They'd go nuts. Yeah. They would go nuts. Yeah. That's really interesting. What was the what was like the caliber of guys like down there in Seattle? Like how how crazy athletic Physically. are those guys? Yeah, you know what the biggest difference was was the O line and D line. Yeah, mm. um, that was the biggest difference. And people are like, people would always say to me, "Well, it's a faster game. It's not a faster game. You have the same game being played on a, a postage stamp right. of a field. Right. Yeah. So, so you can't get as much speed going. Yeah, it's it just looks faster. You're closing on distances. The proximity between the player and the sidelines and the space in between is a lot smaller on an right. NFL it's field, true. so it'll yeah. always look faster. Yeah. You don't have to cover as much space. Mm-hmm. Um, but that the biggest difference was those guys for sure, and those because guys are beasts. You, yeah, yeah, huge, yeah. and because you could have uh, run stop linebackers. Those run stop linebackers would be our, you know, it, and I say our CFL DNs. Like Savages, you'd have a, oh, like, like 260 pound middle linebackers <laughs> right. that wow. are there for first and, and they first and goal they and plug up the box. Exactly, They're plugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and they can move quickly, explosively within like a 10 yard perimeter. For sure, that's it. You know? So those are the, that was the biggest difference. Yeah, I think it's the big. That, that's the biggest misconception as well, though, that the, the athletes are that much better. Hmm. And I don't think that's the case. Yeah, hmm. cool. There's, I think there's definitely more high level athletes down there. Yeah, well, and I mean, they're seeing, they're, we're seeing these like, uh, like what was like, there's like team, like a junior level, like Team Canada and Team America and yeah. Team Europe and yeah. stuff like that. They're like they're having these international. Um, football like tournaments now basically right yeah it's interesting and um, Canada usually does pretty well like we, we hang our own towards the for US sure anyways you know? and I and you never really know what pools they're they're drawing these athletes from sure. from all the countries I mean from what I've been told for the Canada stuff they really pull from Quebec and Ontario mm-hmm. uh, in the states who knows sure I mean I was watching that high probably school. very regional though very regional yeah yeah I was watching that high school f- all-star game on TV the other day, and there's some talented, talented football players on that field as high school players. In the yeah. state. At, yeah. 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 It was the Army-Navy high school all-star game. Oh, wow. And it was wow. pretty neat to watch. Cool. Yeah. I had a, a roommate my first year when I was in the States. Um, we played for a high school out of Cincinnati called Moeller High School. Yeah. And these guys were just crazy. Like, he was the only one on his team that went D2. Everyone else went D1 from his high school. And they were the, always like nationally ranked team. Yep. They would have like they would get like fifty thousand people out to their games. Like for their not for their I think for their state championship game they had like fifty thousand out, and they were just they played uh, the one year they played St. Mike's from Toronto, mm-hmm. and they just clobbered them. Yeah. It was and St. Mike's it, is a good like, program. Yeah, exactly. It was like it was it was bad. It was yeah. like fifty something to nothing basically. Yeah, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> But it just shows you, like, it, well, it's just, you know, it's a numbers game and, like, how important football is to Americans and how much money they put towards it as well. So it's... Well, and again, know, the population size, right? Population Canada's size. Canada's population is equivalent to California. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> so you're going to get a, a higher percentage of more elite athletes. Sure. It's plain yeah. and simple. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, but uh... Yeah, but it was, I don't know. The old McMaster days were so much fun, though. I I think back to those days, man. It's just like, it's just fun. The whole thing, like the whole camaraderie, the team, and hanging out with the guys, and like, you know, just even training. You know, training with For Marcello sure. in the summertime. For yeah, sure, was, it was training great. Was I loved crazy. that summer, that last summer of my last year, where we were just all there at M.M. Robinson. We were just. You know, we were pushing cars and and running and lifting, yeah. and we were all training as a group. And it's cool to see how everyone developed together and improved together. You know, yeah. and then that next year we went out and we just we just crushed it. Yeah, you know, two thousand three was like your big breakout year. Yeah, and we just we just smashed through the OUA basically, except for the one Queens game. Yeah, um, and then the year after that, you guys were even more of a juggernaut. Yeah, it's uh, it's. It's interesting to look back, but you're right in terms of the the camaraderie and, and the the brotherhood. And what I like, you know, what I like about all of it most, and it's fun to relive it all. But I may not talk to you or you for months at a time, and yeah. like like a just like how this happened. Hey, I'm coming to Vancouver. I got to go up to Whistler for three days. Yeah. Let's do podcast. this. Let's do this podcast. Yeah. Let's get a bite tea. Let's go for breakfast on Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. But it's, and, and we get together and we don't skip a beat. But yeah. that's because of the hard times and and the good times and everything in between that yeah. we had together. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. We spent a lot of just time. Period. Like you know whether living together mm-hmm. for one thing and then you know um, fo- like yeah playing together, enjoying and, a few libations, a few at, libations, at yeah. quarters, a couple yeah. lobby pops. You know. Oh my god, <sighs> man! Can you? 
if I drank that much now, I would be dead. <laughs> I think I would die. Like, yeah. <laughs> like it was like, and I, you know, I was not shy. I, back then, I, I I could hold my own with the uh, the the beer consumption for sure. You were legendary. Yeah. You're, you're also probably <laughs> 70 pounds heavier. I was back 70 then. pounds heavier, yeah. heavier yeah. Yeah. and you know, 23, 24 at the time. So yes. my body could handle it. Yeah. Sure. But yeah. and the funny thing is too, back then we we go get bombed and then go train the next day. I know. Like I, I, I can't even imagine doing that now. I think it was 2004. I didn't drink at all. 2004. Right. I yeah, didn't I drink at that. all. Yeah, that but was 2003. But yeah, I remember going. I actually remember one time with you going to the gym. Actually, maybe it was you and Charity and bumping into Marshall, our head coach, on the way to the gym, and we were just hung over. <laughs> oh God! But he puts the fear of God in you, and you just go have the best workout of your sure. life. Yeah, sure. <laughs> he just gives you that cockeyed smirk. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, oh. so he's looking straight through you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it's amazing how much like power or influence he ha- would have over his players. You sure. Know? Yes. And I look back at it, I'm like, why was I so intimidated by him at the time? Yeah. You know? And it, it was because like I really wanted to be there. Like mm-hmm. I really wanted to be playing on his team. So, and he knows that. So he knows he can be as hard as he wants on you. Yeah. And he was. Mm-hmm. You know. But again, it brings out a lot you like it gives you an extra something sure yeah it you shows know, those you hard like, coaches usually yeah. do well oh uh, and it yeah. wasn't a, it wasn't hard to the point where it was abusive abusive it was ex- and maybe he, he expected certain, your best he ex- absolutely yeah. absolutely and when you didn't give your best you know he would let you know about it yeah and um you know nowadays and uh, i mean a lot has changed in everything but you, the people have to be so careful Mm. Oh, is it all politically so, kind of correct now, yeah, sort of thing? Well, I, yeah. get, I guess so. so. I mean, and then just people, more people talk, and it seems like the squeaky wheel nowadays gets the oil you first. Know what it, you know what it, I think it is. It's actually more tension. You know, like the you know the CIS is is really up and coming. It's, mm-hmm. it's getting more popular. It's getting more televised. Um, more money is slowly flowing to it. Yeah. And so uh, you know, it kind of influences people's behavior. You know, but I don't think jobs. anything we experienced was ever wrong or crossed the line or no, anything no, like no, that. No, no, I agree. I, and agree. I, think I mean, sometimes it would be like incredibly intense. Oh, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. You know, I, in retrospect, I mean, even if someone did maybe go a little too far, there would always be an apology. If it was too far, there'd mm-hmm. be some sort of like internal justice to kind of rectify it. Mm-hmm. And it was yeah, all, I mean. but it was in the end, it was all about getting the best out of yourself. Yeah. And yeah. I don't think we would have been the team we were any other way no for yeah. sure no it, it like it the the coach the head coach especially really creates the culture mentality sure uh, by the people he chooses to recruit yep and and you know helps get into the into the university and you know and all that kind of stuff yeah for sure yeah but um you know and then after that obviously you went on to uh, cfl but and then into the uh, olympics yeah. right and you know how did that all kind of transition happen you know, like i, I really remember, I remember you like, talking about it yeah it was, it, was it 28 thorndale south was that what the old place was yeah it was super it was even in college yeah i remember yeah, right. you talked about That's bob right. sliding. i'm like what do you think about bob sliding, man go yeah. play pro football yeah you know it was they, they had sent out emails to and a few of us had got them at the time i can't remember who else got them but it was pretty standard. I think they still do that style of recruiting. Right. Yeah. But it was 09 when I got uh, a letter. It was, I guess, it was probably just about a year before the Vancouver Olympics. And um, it was from the high performance director at the time, Matt Hindle, who's no longer with Bobsley Canada. But he, it was an email saying, we're trying to put together the best team we possibly can. We'll bring you out to Calgary. Um, we'll test you. We'll put you in the ice house, which is one of our training facilities we have there that allows us to push sleds in the summertime cool. on ice. Damn. Um, and we'll see what happens. And, and I was sitting in the kitchen with my dad, and he's like, you know what? And I just I was just had, probably a couple months before that, my second shoulder surgery. Oh. Mm. And he's like, why not? Go. Get out of here. Go to a different training environment for a couple weeks. Um, have fun with it. You never know. Don't close a door. You know, you never totally. know what can happen. Nice. And I went out and tested well, and uh, and then signed with the Edmonton Eskimos as a free agent because I went into free agency. And I remember formulating a plan with the head coach and the high performance director of how this was going to work and if it was going to work. So I was going to play. The plan was, if I remember correctly, I was going to go play the season with Edmonton. On my bye week, I, I was going to come to Calgary and train. 
Uh, as soon as the season was done, I was going to meet up with the team in Europe. And I would have four races to try to make the Olympic team. Cool. So I trained and prepared and kept in touch and went to Edmonton and went through training camp. And first game of the season, I blew my shoulder out again. <laughs> so All right. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So then, it's, it, you know, it, it was one of those things where – and that was – that. I mean, that was – that was a low, low point of my life. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I was going to Edmonton for a fresh start. Uh, my dad played there. I was in his locker. Uh, um, he wow. was at the game. Yeah. And this he is post Hamilton. Actually, I remember watching this post that Hamilton. game specifically. Yeah, 2009. I was rooting for you so hard in that yes. game. I was just like, yeah. man, I want Jesse to succeed. I want him to just tear it up, you yeah. know? I, I knew appreciate he could. That. Yeah, and I was just like, and then I remember that it was like really early on in the game, too, yeah. wasn't it? Just at the end of the day, uh, about five minutes left in the first quarter. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. And yeah, my dad came into the locker room and I was just in tears and I could barely get my pads off. And it was just, you know, it was awful. It was an awful experience yeah. to yeah. to share something like that with somebody, you know, like a, like a parent. But I, I, I'm so happy that at the same time that they were there. But I went home. I remember I went home and I remember, uh, I can't remember which coach said, but you feel sorry for yourself for 24 hours and then you figure out a plan. Yeah. Um, I went to McDonald's. I got like 50 chicken McNuggets <laughs> <Bravo>. <laughs> after, the, after the hospital, <laughs> ate them, went to sleep, woke up, and then contacted BCS, contacted who I needed to contact, went into the Eskimos, uh, figure out what I needed for surgery, got the surgery, and then just went into bobsleigh mode. And uh, the plan actually didn't change much because by the time I was sort of rehabbed and I was able to start running and pushing and stuff with my shoulder, uh, I was in Europe and racing and, and in the four races i was able to make that team and, and, and so how long was it from the injury mm -hmm. and then how long did you when when then did you have the surgery how close to the injury and yeah. then after the surgery how long until you were like pushing sleds and training and it's like competing? Well, it was the first game in the season so that what's that june or july um yeah Maybe july Ju yeah regular season regular season july, july. so it was it was beginning of july uh, surgery was maybe a week and a half after that. And then I was in the ice house, um, that September. Okay. So and yeah. Yeah. So August, August so yeah, two months. No, it was more than, eh, yeah. End of September. So give it three months. Okay. And then I was racing, um, I was racing by the end of November. Wow. It's yeah. Pretty quick. It's very quick. Yeah very very quick and then December January two weeks off and then Vancouver the games hmm. so it was a pretty wild turnaround and experience yeah well we went from like a low to a, a super great high right that's yeah. true wow yeah it's such an emotional very, swing but very how, how gratifying like six months. that must be though you know just to be like like I'm st I, you know I can still do this and perform at a super high level yeah you know? it, it it was and actually how During that time, hmm. um, I, my voice was like getting super raspy, right? Um, and I didn't know what was going Is on. Is that from the the? I had nodes um, on my vocal cords that oh. I didn't know about. I had them checked out, um, and so the they could book me in for surgery, but it was like in February. It was like eh, kind of busy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're like, well, it's something you need to get on. We need to biopsy it. <laughs> so I had this lingering idea. Of, I wasn't overly concerned, but yeah. it just. It just added to the emotional effect of accomplishing something. Like yeah. I remember just being goosebumps and 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 eyes just watering, walking into um, BC place for the opening ceremonies, just yeah. because it was so much stimulus, yeah. right? Yeah. And it just you're surrounded by all these amazing people yeah. that have trying to have been working for however long to get to this pinnacle moment. And then having an entire stadium full of your countrymen, full of your countrymen, just Explode. screaming and exploding like the ex yeah. it was outrageous. Yeah, I can't even imagine what that would feel like or what that's like. It was actually really neat to experience it from the being in the stands in the opening ceremonies in in Russia and being in there and sitting in the stands for when Russia came out, because it was that same sort of thing, and I knew what those guys felt. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And just the eruption of it all. Yeah. It, was, it was very neat. It's wild. Eh? Yeah, it was very wild. Do you think that time, uh, that kind of six-month period from the injury to the Vancouver Olympics, mm -hmm. um, like looking back now, was it, was it, it must have been pretty transformative, eh? It was definitely transformative. It, 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 it was one of those, it was one of those things where you're put in a situation and there's two doors in front of you. 
and you can either walk through the one that's going to, you know, potentially take you to the Olympic Games, or you could go through the one that's kind of creaked open because it's an easy road and say, well, just rehab and, you know, maybe next time and have the, you know, the, all the, you know, the people that, that may have a little bit of doubt mm-hmm. creep into your head. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. it, it is, a, it's a time and there was a time in my life where I think it, you know, now they look back on it, it was definitely, um, a transformative period of, of facing, you know, um, some adversity and, and realizing what I needed to do to, yeah. to go try to accomplish something that was yeah. bigger than what I had gone through before. You've had a lot of adversity in different forms, like throughout your career. Is there one that stands out the most? Probably that one. Yeah. Um, I remember hurting my shoulder for the first time. And that was my first, I guess, major injury. I remember spraining my ankle in university, and I missed a few games, but I was back that season. And this was the first time I actually ever needed surgery in 2008 when I did that shoulder thing. And then doing it, or 2007, and then doing it again in 2008. Right. Um, after coming back and, and getting onto a path where we were having actually a pretty successful year. Uh, and it's just like, oh, I guess I can swear. Oh, yeah, fuck me. <laughs> I got to do this again. Yeah. Yeah. I got to yeah. go through this yeah, again. That was uh, yeah. Hamilton, right? Yeah. yeah. And then in Edmonton for the third time, same shoulder. It was just that, that rock bottom yeah. sort of feeling. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So. Yeah. It, the transformative is definitely and an, an just an eye opening. Yeah. And then didn't you come back after the Van Ock, Vancouver Olympics uh, to Calgary? I did. Yeah, that's when you did your knee. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Actually, that's that's a pretty good one too. And <laughs> at that point, was it almost like was it almost like comical? You're just like, whatever. Like, well, you know, or, or was it still pretty pretty tough? So I got cut by Edmonton after the right. Vancouver, and right. then it was a free agent and trained. I wanted to come back and play football and yeah. and, and join the Stamps and. They said, you know, with my history, I was a sure a liability, but I just I, I started out the practice roster. I took a minimum wage uh, contract, base layer contract. Cool. Wow. Because uh, I, I just wanted to play football. Yeah. That's the only thing I wanted to do. Yeah. And I grinded for through a few weeks of uh, practice roster. Yeah. Um, I got my opportunity um, with a couple weeks left in the season. Right. Uh, it was against Hamilton. Mm. Uh, had like a couple special teams tackles and scored a touchdown. And again, it was, you know what, after that game, there was a sense of uh, not relief, but just it was a reminder because what I think had happened with these injuries and these and, and so many people saying, you know, you suck, you're shit, you can't play football. And, and, and oh, it, that's such a shit attitude. Too. But and, and you like, know, but it happens and it's the media and it's other people and it's yeah. been it's people who have no business saying it, but it, it it's there and, and, and some of it creeped into my head and it actually I doubted my own abilities right. when the only thing that was stopping me from playing football at the ability that I could was my body. And that's something that I couldn't control. Yeah. So getting into that end zone um, I dropped my knees and I just had an ear to ear smile and the guys on the team were happy for me. Yeah. And then the next week I go and blow up my knee <laughs> to make a tackle. Right. Yeah. So it was, again, it was one of this and then right back down uh, to here. <laughs> and then yeah. I just said, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's such a lot. And like a running back, man, like the running back position in football is just, you guys take so much punishment. Right? Well, and I never like, shied away from it either. No, you yeah. never did. That was your style. You, 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 but you ran it's just hard. like, I mean, your body, your, your ligaments can only take so much. Yeah, that's what it comes down to. It's one, of, and, and 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 people ask often how my how my shoulder's doing, how's my knee doing, and with bobsleigh, it's a piece of cake. Sweet. It's a linear sprint, and it's, yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. My, yeah. structurally I'm built to sprint, and it's 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 fun, and I have a great time, and yeah. It's true. You are built to sprint, man. Yeah. Like it's, I'm all something, legs. Yeah, you're all <laughs> legs, you know. Massive glute. You're just powering through. It's cool, man. And yeah, it's, 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 but it's, uh, I mean, it was it was unique to see you play because, like, you're a big guy, too. You're six, almost 6'3", six right? Yeah. And uh, I think at your heaviest, what, 230 Playing football, like, yeah. just, uh, yeah, 225. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So it's just it's cool to see uh, such a big man move so quick. It's it's just like whoa. It was exciting. It's like seeing like an animal, like you know when you see like a, a lion or something. Yeah. You get that kind of like, damn, this guy's like, you know, he's a superhuman in a way you oh, know, compared to the that. compared well, to the po- like the general population. Yes, you were, man. You were an elite level athlete. You're an Olympian. I remember like your body was just like, and and you were a sprinter. So it's even more like impressive. It's crazy to watch you run was so crazy. Like. I remember one time, it was later in the last year, 2003, 
and I was on the side that was with Fab, and you were on the field, and we were off for some reason. And uh, he's just like, man, I just love watching Jesse run. I'm like, I know. Okay. It's like it's like so fun to watch you yes, run. It very was exciting. Like, it was just like watching you run was just like, wow. You just, Thanks, your jaw buddy. just drops, and you're just like, that's crazy. <laughs> like the stuff you could do, how guys would just like bounce off. Of you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was crazy. And were, and not to mention, you had the strength, but then you also had the speed. Like you would outrun guys. You're outrunning yes. DBs. Yeah, it was yeah. it was crazy. It was and amazing then, to yeah, watch. And then you have like this warrior spirit, man. Like yeah. you see it in that bobsled picture. Well, anyone who's watching I this, love that go to floathouse.ca, go to our float ambassadors page <laughs> and go and check out this picture and you'll know what we're talking about you'll see this warrior spirit encapsulated in that picture when he po posted that on facebook like years ago i made the comment uh all i said was all you're missing from this picture is a sword and a shield yeah <laughs> <laughs> i know a picture that's what it looked about. like man yeah. you looked like you were out of lord of the rings or something like that it was it was great <laughs> ready to take on anything <laughs> yeah that was uh i think that was one of your like European tour pictures, was it not? Or was it Olympics? Uh, I think I'd have to look at it. I think it was Olympics. I'd be able to tell by my suit. Okay, what about Vancouver Olympics though? Maybe I think like the two man or something like that. Okay, yeah, probably. Maybe who knows? If I was that fired up, yeah, you were fired. Ooh, spicy meatball. Yeah, yeah, man, that's cool. And now I mean, we still have to get you guys down the track. Oh, I'd love to. Oh, yeah, I'm down. Yeah, I'm down. That would be exhilarating. We'll get you there. We'll get you. That'd be transcending. They're doing actually one of the reasons why I'm here um, is they've started to do these. They're called plank sleds now. Oh. Um, they're they're a normal two man bobsleigh, but they don't articulate. So a bobsleigh articulates in two ways: the axle of the runner, when it comes onto a corner, turns first, and then the shell of the sled matches it. Okay. And the reason that it articulates when it comes onto a corner um, is to keep constant friction on the steel that we slide on to ice for speed, so you're not slapping on. Gotcha. So what they've done is taken all the articulation out of these things, out of these plank sleds, um, and they're pretty much impossible to crash. So hmm. that's given the public an opportunity to actually drive a bobsled as opposed to just like sit in a tour sled and have somebody else drive. Wow. So that's what we're going up to. Uh, Helen and I are going up to um, Whistler to to do that with Rick Mercer tomorrow. So oh, that's fun. super fun. Yeah, that'll oh, be fun. That's great. Nice. That'll Very be cool. interesting. I'm gonna see how. I'm going to test that theory on crashing those sleds. <laughs> <laughs> Put it to the test too. Will you be driving? Uh, I'm going to be... I'm going to be driving just for fun, and then when we do the, the, the TV stuff, push. I'm going I'm to push Rick. So you need to get the, the speed going? Yeah, exactly. Wow, cool. Give That's him a fun. start. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it'll be fun. And uh, you're doing a lot of commentating now uh, for the CIS games in the West, the CIS West, or what's it called? Canada West Football. Canada West, yeah. that's right. And... Uh, yeah, so you seem to be enjoying that quite a bit. Yeah, it's the last time we touched base when yes, I was out here for right. a UBC game, and yeah. just watching football and talking about it. Yeah, oh, it's great. <laughs> it's yeah. great. It, I, I, I agree, man. Like, obviously, my experience is only doing this podcast, which mm -hmm. is it's fun. It's a fun thing, but uh, I think calling football would be really fun. But you know, it probably takes a little bit of while to like to, to learn how to do it. You yeah. Know? Like it's a unique kind of, it's like learning a language almost, you know? It is. And it's just like doing the podcast and, and talking right. with people and having, uh, you know, it's, it's about talking what you see about what you see. Cause cool. the perspective that we would see on a, while watching a football game is, is so different, um, from just anybody who's just following the ball, following the ball. Right. Yeah, we right. see things so differently and that's why you see a lot of former football players could get into commentary and if you right. can get the hang of the timing and or the coaches. pace and, yeah. and and the coaches like John Gruden is my favorite cool uh, commentator color commentator because yeah. he is so intricate and he knows everything and he, he can just see it and draw it up and I'm He's like that is a Super Bowl winning head coach exactly exactly so it's but for you know at the Canada West level you get to know the guys it's you know what we all went through and it's just fun to to, to, to watch some football cool. and talk about it. Do you watch like commentating now differently? I do. Because you, you were like, oh, I'm studying up stuff. Of, you yeah, study it. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and it's, um, and it's not necessarily, it's, it's hearing how they describe it or why they describe it. And, you know, in comparative to how I would have done it, right. but it may, you know, the way they did it may be better. The way I thought I did it may be better. So yeah. it just, but you just learn, right? Sure. It's just, it's, it's just getting, all this information coming yeah. at you because well, there's so much of it. You're still going to be expressing yourself and you're like, you know, but you, you want to be influenced, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's what, I mean, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Yeah. I do. You well, know? you got And me I listen the... to it from a different angle now. Yep. You know, and uh, just uh, 
get better at doing this and you know and just get more comfortable with it you know what i mean well, but then but then it also becomes our own thing like i've often described our podcast kind of like a, a hybrid between joe rogan and london real in terms of its style like we're not mm-hmm. i mean and those are pretty <coughs> lofty you know comparisons but what's in terms, terms of, of the a style? stylistic approach what's london reels like it's more like interview style one, okay. it's now one-on-one it used to be more kind of like this yep. but he, he's pretty formal he has questions and stuff like that mm-hmm. and uh which is good it's cool but he also will free ball it a little bit sure like, um not quite as much as we talk probably but uh I don't know. He, he, I think he runs a great podcast. Yeah, I'm gonna, I mean, I'm gonna start listening to this. Great. Does an amazing job. You guys got podcast. me into the to this whole podcast pod- media, media. podcast world. Yeah, yeah, man, it's fun, man. I love it. Yeah, and it's what I listen to when I drive now. And yeah, I, and I have about five or six on the go, and I nice. really enjoy it. And they're all very, very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, Brian, yeah. he 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 does a really slick presentation. Like he's got like, great real. cameras yeah. and like yeah, his looks new- really polished. And then he does like really cool like uh, like highlight reels clips before his podcast yeah, so like okay. trailers so it's like trailers before he does and then he's the, usually this is really cool intro where he'll walk around like a, a historical place in london and sure talk about the podcast coming up then he'll do his sponsorship stuff and then he'll get into the podcast and he he does he, i think he's one of the most polished ones that i've seen yeah yeah i yeah. agree i agree i think he's uh he's definitely evolved tremendously and he keeps trying to better himself and it's really an awesome just and you get to see it. That's the cool thing about the podcast is I'm sure people. I'm sure there's a couple people who has been who have watched us from early on and that probably see us grow. And they, not that we've been going leaps and bounds, but it has. There has been an evolution for sure with it, you know. And so yeah. it's fun. You can watch the whole thing. I can tell you guys have grown. Yeah. Yeah. Even Thanks, after man. even after like five or six podcasts, it just becomes more comfortable. Yeah. It's 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 easy to see and you're just going to continue to get better at it cool thanks yeah. man and i always forget i keep I and mean, you talk about the intro and stuff i always forget that podcasting is on video too and even with the camera stuck in my face <laughs> like i and we sneak them there they're yeah. like these little these little insect recorders little like hey, yeah. drone things hey, something like transformers or something yeah. like that yeah. yeah oh yeah you don't just sound to think about the cameras that's why we put the screen here so it's just like so the guest not, doesn't see it so i'm not looking at it you're not getting all distracted yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, look, <laughs> you guys look great there Oh, Mike! Mike looks Mike. golden. Look he at looks his hair. stoic. He looks stoic. Look at him! Look at him! Now he's flexing oh. for the camera. I look big there. That's you good. do look big right. there. <laughs> not saying you're not big. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not big right now. Well, yeah, I'm. But, I'm still in healing mode, obviously. Yeah, so, yeah. I, but, I got so. a question for you. So sure. I've been intrigued. I've been like watching online your new hobby mm-hmm. of bow hunting. Yeah. And I think it's so cool. And it's really interesting that you're doing it because Joe Joe Rogan mm-hmm. is now doing. He said a. a professional bow hunter on his podcast i think twice now and he yeah. has the other guy the outdoor wilderness guy oh, cameron haynes is the bow hunter yeah he's over who's that yeah. steve ranella i think steve ranella yeah. so he's talking about hunting kind yeah. of guy and now rogan i think he posted an instagram picture of him bow hunting yeah so he came up to alberta to, to yeah. for yeah. his first uh, bear at first hurt with cam i uh, did a, sp- a spring bear hunt with cameron in uh, s- uh, southern alberta so what, what what got you into that i, I well i've been shooting since 2008 archery just at paper paper yeah. target shooting and i loved it and it was uh, jason moss who got me into it my quarterback That's right, i remember that yeah and um i bought his bow off of him and then uh with my shoulder injuries i actually planned on shooting and getting into more bow hunting um before i did because but i was limited by my injuries um so the, it's been the last few years I've, I've spent more and more time with it and um but again, it's the sport of archery that really got me into it, and, the, and, and that I love. I, I have th- I have three bows. I have a compound bow that I hunt with, um, that you see most guys hunt with. Uh, I have a, an Olympic recurve bow that I shoot paper targets at for, for for shits and giggles. And then Helen, my girlfriend, who's floating, uh, and some family members bought me um, a longbow, a, a, a traditional longbow. That's so cool. Need. Yeah, it's it's and it's gorgeous, and cool. it's from Latvia. These these tool makers in Latvia that are just phenomenal and um so that's primarily primarily what i've been shooting um on a daily basis because it's so much more difficult just with a stick and string that's all it is essentially is a stick and string yeah okay. with a compound bow you have uh the technology of the cams that allow you to pull a ton of weight which yeah. produce a ton of energy behind an arrow uh you have a sight that's not really a sight it just gives you um your sight is based off of pins and each pin represents distance so it's not like it's a lot of technology, but it's enough to help with um, correcting mistakes, correcting mechanical, uh, biomechanical mistakes. So um, I would love to be able to hunt with my longbow at some point. 
That's wow. like the I'd ultimate love to. goal. That's the ultimate goal. That yeah. would be amazing because that's like, once you can hunt with a longbow, that's like, that's a very simple piece of technology. Exactly. That, uh, you know, could provide for you. But you have to be so proficient if you want to be an ethical hunter. Yeah. And um, guys, that, and he hasn't been on, I, I've listened and I listened to recently Jim Shockey, who's probably one of the biggest names in hunting yeah. was on Joe Rogan's podcast. Yeah, I podcast. know his daughter. I used to dance salsa with his daughter. Eva. Yeah. Good for you. Well, not <laughs> you. I mean, she, lucky duck. <laughs> yeah, she's she's uh, she's beautiful. And she'll kill you if she's you're mean to her. <laughs> right. She was really good at salsa too. She was. Uh, she was. Yeah. I went. This is say I went to that class a lot. I bet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It. Um, now you know why I got so good at salsa. No. <laughs> you were. You were. You were good. good. I remember you were what you were doing. Salsa. salsa. Hey, when you know. put that video up online, I was just. Because I didn't, see, I didn't see how much you were practicing it or what you were doing with I practiced it. Practiced a lot. But then when yeah. you put that video, I was like, "Wow, you became like a salsa king." Yeah. Like you're just like, I wouldn't go that far. It's pretty, pretty basic. Stuff, well, it looked good. I mean, that was a routine. So routine, you can really kind of polish up. But you're right. But no, but I mean, it is about how you can carry your body and For move sure. your body. And, uh, and that was, it's funny. Like that was what I got into after football. Yeah. So I went to UBC. So yep. I did my career at Mac up and down career and you know which I can definitely relate to you on a lot you know mm -hmm. like your pro career versus my uh, my collegiate career was up and down up and down right yeah um, and so I went to UBC to you know give one last kick at the can and after the, the first regular season game I was like you know what I'm done yeah I'm just like I just wanted to stop you know I just didn't have it in me I didn't want to go to practice didn't want to do it and you know it was late maybe within a month I just saw the poster on the bus stop I'm like, shit, why not? Let's go to Salsa. Exactly. So I went and did that, and I was like, this is so much fun. It was so much fun. I've always enjoyed moving my body to rhythmic beats and music. <laughs> <laughs> I and, do remember. Uh, <laughs> this was just like, you get to get, you get to be all wiggly with it. And I just, <laughs> I I loved it, you know? So, yeah. and then yeah. uh, I, I did a little performance at the Vancouver Salsa Convention. Yeah, you did. And um, Just blew the top off that place. I did another like, fundraising did. performance at this restaurant one time. And that was that was probably the pinnacle. That one was like yeah. the pinnacle. I still have that video somewhere. I put it on my MySpace. <laughs> but I, that's like the only thing I had on MySpace. If there's anybody who's born in 1990 or older, you won't Go know MySpace. MySpace. Yeah, check out Mike dancing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you'll have to create an account. Yeah. So, I so anyways, back to bow hunting. Yes, um, back to bow hunting. <laughs> no, if they go hand in hand. Salsa and bow hunting go hey, hand in hand. They're all arts, man. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. But, so now, now you're actually like hunting. You're actually going on hunting. Yeah, during the seasons, I spend a lot of time yeah. uh, with the preparation. And there's a lot of the lot that goes into it, especially with bow hunting. Sure. Uh, you have to proximity of getting to an animal is, is 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 what I've learned over the last four years, three four years of hunting is is not as easy as as it looks. And and you watch totally TV shows sure. and you can see some guys who are so so good at it, but it takes so much patience, time, skill. There's so much that goes into it. You are in an element that you don't belong in, and they have the advantage because their whole purpose of being there is survival. Yeah. They're not, Crazy. once they get away from you, they're not going home to watch Modern Family. No, no. They're then going to try to elude their the life wolves is survival. and the grizzlies and the coyotes and protect their young so they can reproduce and continue. But at the same time, we, you know, are considered an alpha predator, just like a wolf, just like a grizzly. And, and as, long as, as long as, you know, I, I've been a carnivore all my life. And once I started to understand not only the nutritional benefits, but, um, just the, just immersing myself in the entire process of, of trying to provide for myself, which is something that is so far gone in our culture. Oh yeah. Um, in yeah. terms of being a carnivore, mm. um, you know, I wanted to I wanted to be able to do that. I wanted to be able to fill my freezer and provide for my friends and family. Yeah, I I really li respect that um, opinion and attitude. Like I, one of my kind of beasts with people is sometimes when, uh, you know, they they have such a, a big disconnect from where their food comes from. Yeah. And they get this nice meat packaged product and they're just sure. like, okay, I'm going to consume this meat. And they don't really understand that that was like a life and that was actually, it was just like a, it's just a product to them. Yeah. You know, and my own little rule of thumb that I used to have, which is and just from like spear fishing and fishing and that kind of thing was if you can't kill it, I don't know if you should be eating it, you know? Yeah. And that's maybe kind of harsh, but it's just like, it's weird to have this disconnect of like, I'm not going to kill it, yeah. but I'm willing to eat and it. And let that yeah. be clear. You know? It's not the, like the, the skills to go and kill it but like to actually end its life. For sure. Right. So let's say, um, let's say you're a fish eater 
and someone else catches the fish, but it's still alive in front of you. You don't have to have the skill to go catch the fish, but you should have the, um, I'd say integrity, actually. integrity. Yeah. yeah. And, you know. and respect to be able to kill that fish that you will later be eating. You know, yeah. and just the act of killing something's life to consume for your, you know, benefit. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, it's such a, it's a, such a touchy subject, and you know, there's a lot of people that, um, there's a lot of people that are against it. Yeah. But there's a lot of people who aren't educated on the topic either. Um, yeah. I I will never pass judgment if you choose not to eat meat, if you choose to totally. live a lifestyle of, of 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 not harming an animal. But you shouldn't pass judgment to others who do choose to do that. Especially considering uh, for where, from where we came from, yeah, and then how we developed, and then where we got to be where we are. Um, well, we wouldn't be here without animal protein, and that's proven. And that's yeah. uh, I mean, th- there was an evolutionary step where we started to scavenge, and 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 the protein that we started consuming from animals allowed us to develop at such a quicker rate. It helped with the brain development. I yes. Think. Yeah. So. And I personally think that um, hunting for your meat and actually going out and selectively killing one animal uh, is the most ethical way to get your meat anyways. Yeah. You know, instead of this, these farmed cows or factory farms that you see out sure. there, uh, you're going out there and you're, you're, you're taking one animal mm-hmm. and you're going to take that animal back and you're going you're gonna to process it, you're going to freeze it, and you're going to eat it, mm-hmm. you know. But people aren't comfortable with that idea, and they're more comfortable with the idea of going to a store, a grocery store, and buying a packaged piece of meat. Well, it's easier to be disconnected. It's such a strange disconnect, right? Do you think, though, that let's say the whole world was eating game or wild, Mm -hmm. um, is that sustainable right now? As long as it's... uh, Hunting is very, very regulated. Um, Is there enough animal population to feed the protein population of 7 billion. I don't know, to be honest with you. No, we don't know, right? And, uh, but, uh, yeah. Well, that's where the whole argument comes in about uh, we should be eating insects. Right. Yeah, I heard that. The, the, whole, the yeah. insect bars, your boys brought, uh, the, yeah, the, the they, doctors they, brought. They, they were made of crickets. I'd give it a go. Well, they okay. tasted like chocolate. They were delicious. You know, and they say the go. cricket is like one step away from, uh, from being a lobster, actually. Hmm. So it's almost the same. If you can eat a lobster, you can eat a cricket. Yeah. And uh, the reason, like, uh, there's, what was the term the doctor used yesterday? Uh, basically, only 10% of the energy that animal an animal oh. eat will actually move up the food chain to the next animal. It's called so trophic. What's it called? It's not entropic. It's actually trophic. Trophic? Trophic energy. So, like, yeah, it's trophic the energy. energy that, you know, <clears throat> it all, it's all measurable. This is all, like, science of, of kilojoules and kcals and all that kind of stuff. Like, yeah. the actual energy quantified in a calorie and how it's consumed from, I don't know how it all works. But, yeah. like, yeah, it's a very efficient, inefficient way. What is it? To eat an animal that eats animals? It's higher up on the food chain. Right. Exactly. So, right. their whole argument is that we should energy be eating... Wise. Like if you want to feed a mass population, you should be eating the lower food chain animals as opposed to the higher food chain animals. Right. Yeah. Well, eat but those more more often and eat the higher ones less often. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, okay, everyone could have game, mm-hmm. but it's just like, how much can we have? Yeah. You know, special yeah. occasions maybe, or maybe once a month or once, once every couple of weeks, who knows, you know yeah. what I mean? Or once a week, who but knows? I, but again, though, I think if you're going to eat meat, and that's your choice, and that's fine. And it actually is probably a healthy choice to make. I think we do need some animal proteins in our diet to mm-hmm. have a complete diet. Yep. I think hunting for your meat is the most ethical way of doing it. Sure. You know, like for for example, when we're spearfishing, you know, we're not just dragging and trolling the ocean of oh, whatever God. comes up. Yeah. We're going down there. Yeah. We're seeing one fish. Yep. We know it's an edible fish. Yep. We're not just fishing with a line, which we could catch anything. It probably won't be edible anyways. Yep. We're picking one fish. We're taking it. Boom, take it, and there's your dinner. You know, and I don't really see a bigger issue with that and i think people get into the whole animal cruelty subject and people get so sensible animal to animal absolutely cruelty. but like, and i, and I like, think it's again it's it's uh, you're gonna get people who are sensitive on just about every subject totally. nowadays and, yeah. and with the way that we our world works with social media and stuff like that pointing the finger is so easy to do Ugh. Um, but it's an understanding and it's in, and it's life choices and it's, yeah. uh, you know what bothers me and actually eva uh, shockey has done a very very good job at it and um you know, getting the criticism being um, an attractive female who hunts and posting pictures of the animals she's killed or harvested, however you want to say it, uh, gets a lot of backlash, a lot sure. of death yes. threats. Yeah. What? Wow. That's just... Okay, to her okay, and her... a death threat? To her and to her, fa- to her family. <laughs> That's um, just gross. But like, what's the difference between 
And, and what's the difference between posting an animal that you chose to kill yourself that you're going to eat, smiling with it, or hearing the ba da ba 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 and somebody dripping greasy burger <laughs> on their face, smiling away? Yeah. There's two steps, S- processing it and cooking it. Yeah. So whether it's a cow or a deer or an elk or a moose or a bear, what we're seeing is like this separation from like mm. you said the disconnect and that and that's what that's what bothers me the most in those situations yeah exactly <laughs> yeah I, like I, well I we mean, had this one video i gotta just say this i haven't said it yet but i really want to talk about it we posted this one video of this rabbit okay and it was a rabbit in a sink a domesticated <laughs> rabbit. A domesticated rabbit and it was a pet rabbit i'm yeah. assuming yeah. and um they were headed in, a, in like a warm bath of water and it looked like it was just, it was just like lying there. It was all chilled out. And we posted it up on Float House because we were like, look at this guy. This is how you feel after a float. And the rabbit's just lying there. It's like, like this, you know. And, um, and then we had so much hate over that one post. Yeah. People threatened to stop coming to us. In fact, one person said, I was going to like be a customer of yours. And because of this, I'm not going to anymore. And they're, they're basically uh, saying it was animal cruelty, which... It didn't look like it was, but maybe it was. In terms of the video but itself, there are people who are saying that, oh, that, look at that rabbit's drugged. It's obviously drugged. In the video, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. There's yeah. no evidence of it at all. And in fact, uh, it looked like it was in like a very relaxed state, but at, at yeah. even at the end of the video, it like kicked back into like l- consciousness, kind of into life, and like was behaving like exactly like a normal rabbit would. So, you know, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I don't know, but there is no evidence of it at all. So they were just assuming that it was. Well, I, 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 I truly hope that, but by, by having me on here as a carnivore hunter, not going to deter people from coming here. No. I, I, I hope not. And and if they're that sensitive about, it, I mean, the one thing about eating meat too is that you got to understand, like, life eats life on this planet. That's how life evolved. That's how life is. You know, and it, it, to go and hunt for your food. It's far more respectful than going to go just to an all-you-can-eat buffet and just wolfing down whatever the fuck you're going to be eating. And just so everybody knows, you know, I do actually, it's in the process, I, I will be growing my own garden as well. Cool. I'd like to be self-sustainable. This is like, this is the goal. It's not about, it's, that's not, very cool. it's not about yeah. a bloodlust. It's not about killing an no, animal. No, of course it's not. It's about the process. It's about the hunt. The meat, to, in all honesty, um, I spent, uh, before I, I shot my white tail this year, I spent 20 days in my tree stand, 20 days wow. of either being one of the last people, you know, up in that area uh, to see to see the world go to sleep or to see the world wake up. That's so cool. And during that time, I had a deer walking under me. I watched a coyote hunt for mice. Um, I haven't seen a bear yet, which, which I think would be very neat. And I oh, haven't yeah. seen a wolf yet. Yeah. Those are the two things that I'm looking forward to. But it's being part of nature but you're not there at all if you're if you're good at what you're doing. That right. doesn't mean pulling out your phone and playing Candy Crush <laughs> while you're sitting <laughs> in a tree stand. It's about experiencing the world waking up, seeing it happen, yeah. seeing nature, yeah. and seeing how it, how it how it works. And let me tell you, it can be a very cruel place to be at the same time. Oh, sure. Yeah. And if you're not willing to to be a part of that, if you're willing to be, you know, in a comfortable comfortable it's it's you know it's not the place for you not everybody has to hunt not no, everybody I, has to do that no. just don't point the finger at the people who do decide to do it that are doing it in an ethical way because there's some jackass hunters out there as well that ruin it for fucking the people that are trying to do it the right way right and doing it for the right reasons yeah yeah well i think i think you know you all you all i mean there's a whole spectrum of people and you're always going to have all ends of the spectrum absolutely always. it's just like you know, it just seems to be the case always until like the, until the world's in some sort of weird, perfect, harmonious balance of everything mm-hmm. There's going to be imbalance, including human behaviors. But that will never be true, though, because people are inherently uh, built unevenly. Mm-hmm. You know? yep. There's some people that are smaller, some people that are yep. bigger, some people are weaker, some people are stronger, some yep. are smarter, some are dumber. It's all a spectrum. Right. Yeah, yeah. And we're all going to have advantages or disadvantages. We're all going to have something to be jealous of, uh, about sure. of somebody else potentially. And it's all just ego. It's all just ego bullshit. It's like us trying to, uh, well, it's us comparing ourselves to other people and mm-hmm. being like, I'm not enough for whatever reason that is. And uh, it, it's it's really just your own ego playing tricks yeah. on you and letting you, you know, it's, it's the whole thing about getting past that and dissolving mm-hmm. that and realizing being happy with what you are and with what you have. Yeah. You know? And I think that's, 
Yeah, it's so just being important happy. to like, being alive. Like ex- existential like anxiety is, I think, uh, a real thing. And I think whether people are conscious of it or not, I think just the just the act of being alive and existing in a human form is like this, uh, you know, stressful thing. And and people react to it in a you know barrage of different ways. Some people are better, like they're just more balanced, and other people are you know, have to self-medicate with different things and other sure. people have to do lots of, you know, it's, it's so interesting to see, man. But um, I think connecting with nature like you're doing helps bring you mm. back into balance, you know. Oh, it's my like, church, man. It's, yeah. it's, 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 I love it. And um, some of the, the best days that I've spent out there, you know, I didn't even draw my bow back and I just watched. I mean, I've watched an, a, an elk herd of 200 just bugling and screaming like crazy cool. and i can promise you there aren't many things that'll make your hair stand up on the back of your neck like having an elk uh, a big bull elk close enough just to scream a bugle at you and just <laughs> oh, like wow. chills the blood it is yeah, wild cool. and see him battling and see them how they interact and uh it's 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 pretty it's pretty cool and oh, there's yeah. there's days that you know i just want to if i had like a nice camera i would just want to take pictures yeah Again, cool. it's it, it's right. It's why you're out there. Yeah, no, it's cool to bring that into your life. You know, that's something that's one of my goals uh, of 2015. Really, is just to bring more nature into my life. Yeah, just getting out there a bit more. You know, just simple things. Is we and it's, we're very fortunate to live in the city we live in, where we can go not very far at all and experience just stunning, so much. stunning nature. You yeah, know? and really get away from people too. We are, you know, in the city we get this kind of. Uh, uh, you know kind of veil of being in this very populated space but you know what we're actually quite isolated there's you know you don't have to go very far to feel very like alone i know it's you awesome know? yeah i love it it's cool <laughs> sweet man well you know what i think we should uh we call it a it night up. holy that, that was, was quick eh? yeah it was an hour it's an hour yeah that's an hour i mean it's a, it's a shorter one yeah it's a shorter, that's, it's a shorter podcast that's yeah. good if if it felt it feels good. Hopefully, it doesn't piss too many people off. <laughs> no, uh, I think be people, some people really that angry the people that will there. end up listening to this podcast, I think, are going to be kind of like minded and probably <clears throat> whatever that means, you know. Yeah. And because um, either you enjoy hearing the conversations we have, and or you don't. And so you do a very good job of bringing all sorts of people into yeah. your into your float float house world the vancouver real world that's in this uh, street level studio here i've i've really enjoyed what you guys put out there sweet man thank yeah. you that's yeah it's fun we just have fun with it and really it's whoever um kind of uh you know uh scratches our itch will come on that's really what it's, whatever we feel like really that's yeah. awesome yeah, yeah. Cool. All well, right, Jesse, man. man, thanks for coming. It's Jesse Lumsden on Facebook and at Jesse Lumsden 28. If you want to just kind of keep up to date with tweet this me. young. Yeah, tweet, <laughs> tweet him. at him. Ask him questions. Ask him questions about Please. life, about football, about archery, about, about hunting, yeah. about, uh, you know, being so handsome. Oh, gosh. Oh, and one <laughs> other thing I'd uh, love to touch on is I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I am like some ultimate hunter predator that's out there. No. There's so much to learn. <clears throat> And so much you can immerse yourself in. And I'm learning so much from so many different people. And one of the things that, I mean, the social media and the Twitter has done is connect me with some very, very cool people. And some very, very interesting people on, um, you know, on both sides, both sides of the spectrum. From vegans, vegetarians, and and, and hunters, and and farmers, and and, um, ranchers, and stuff like that. It's very cool. That's true. And on that note, I should say, I love the vegans. Don't worry. It's okay. I love everybody. I like how you're you're standing up for something you believe in, and uh, absolutely, if you really believe in that, then great, awesome. You can Good follow me you. at Mike underscore Zaremba. I've never said that before. Wow, you should start promoting yourself. I don't. I, I, don't, I forget my I, Twitter handle. I'm, I'm, I don't. I don't tweet. You I don't, don't tweet. I have it, but I don't really have it. Eh, I'm yeah, very minimally active on my, on my Twitter. So <laughs> step your tweet game up, bro. I don't know. I don't know. You don't know. We got too much Facebook Facebook house, social media to do. That's, that's enough. Instagram, you guys are doing a great job on Instagram. I said this to you. Yeah, this guy, uh, the the float club. Oh, you like that one? Brilliant, brilliant. I'm glad we got some positive feedback from that Dude, one. Dude, like, I haven't, you I haven't felt uh, people were really digging it. I dug it. Everyone dug it. You, no, some of the cool people were digging it. We have you. <laughs> you were digging it. We had a couple other cool people that were like, yeah, I can, I can get into this. You yeah. know. But some people are like, float club? What's the float club? Nobody was like that. <laughs> nobody. <laughs> nobody <laughs> That's what I'm imagining. I don't know. <laughs> know. <laughs> Internet trolls sitting at home. What's the float, float club? club. Nobody. There was no negative. Did he shirt off? 
fighting? What? What is that do with floating? I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I get it because I live with you guys. <laughs> it's true. That was a very impactful movie for us. Yeah. So. Kind of uh, puts our generation. Do we are we have we ended this yet? No, no, we're still going. Do we have to end it right now? No. Can we continue for a few more yes. minutes? Yes. One of the things um, about God, talking about the floating side of things is the benefits that that I've experienced as an athlete that you guys have been able to provide to me. That I hope you get more athletes in here. Mm-hmm. And I know the boys came out. The guys that I slid with this, yeah. they they yeah. came in yeah. for a float, which was uh, hopefully a positive experience. But in terms of um, the recovery that we need, recovery that athletes need, and telling all the athletes that are out there or people are just training hard. There's two ways that you can repair your nervous system. And I think well, sleep is one of them. And Rest, yeah. And, and, and floating. Because you're, like you said, it's sensory deprivation, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's one thing that allows your nervous system to finally start to rejuvenate. Because if yeah. it's not this, it's this. If it's not this, it's that guy dancing with his pants around his ankle right there. <laughs> He's not actually oh, doing yeah. it. Well, <laughs> yeah, gas I wouldn't be surprised at all. Not at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, no, it's so true. It's, well, it's, it's such a restorative thing. And uh, I, I wish more athletes would get into it. Mm-hmm. We had the, the BC Lions O-line come in. We had Kabongo in that tank. Did you? Six foot eight. Yeah. He's a big man. 350 pounds. Yeah. Dude, well, we had there, no problem. Do you remember yeah. the big yeah. show from WWE Wrestling? Yeah, 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 yeah. He came twice. Nice. He's seven foot two, 428 pounds. And he fit in. He came back. And, and for him, like, he was limp. I didn't talk to him too much. He, you know, I, I didn't want to, like, bombard the, a, a celebrity type. You know, he's yeah. just a dude, right? Yeah. So, um, but. Uh, I mean, he's a he's probably in his early 40s now, and being that big on your joints, yeah, he, I could see him like limping and stuff like that. So you know, his knees are taking a toll. Oh, but yeah. I, I can only imagine just the floating aspect of floating, the the part where you get to be completely suspended in a solution that completely conforms to every square millimeter of your body. For sure is this a tremendous release yeah. physically and then that will just kind of compound into a psychological mental release the the extreme physical relaxation you experience in there just automatically puts you into a psychologically relaxed state and yeah. then that starts going deeper and deeper and deeper like there's a reason we've been floating for four years and haven't stopped so let me ask you a question and i've i've come to coin the term when I'm talking about myself or talking to people who don't know is entering the void and it's that space uh, of right one. before you drift off to actually go to sleep but you wake up yeah mm. that would be probably referring to uh, theta state theta state yeah. okay yeah. so is there a way to train yourself to stay there totally that's what floating is but so it's getting to that point and being able to stay there because yeah. I've been able to get there a couple times, and my limited and as a bad, I'm a bad ambassador because I haven't floated. <laughs> you don't a ton. live in the city, yeah, so it's okay. It, but I've been able to get there a few times during floats. Mm. But as soon as I get there, I feel like I get out of it quickly. Yes, as soon as you, it's because part of it is like um, a meditation as well, and like you know, part of it is like you, we hear people talk about that 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 uh, state of like no mind or no thought that is actually going into a theta state through a meditation avenue or through an extreme yoga practice okay yeah and it's as soon as you kind of realize you're there you start thinking again yeah Um, and floating it's kind of easier to get in there because floating will sometimes push you past beyond theta state into delta sure where you actually kind of go into a a unconscious sleep yeah Um, and then it'll bring you back into a beta uh, or not not usually into a beta a beta is your most consciousness it goes there's four levels there's beta which is what we're all in right now this alert conscious state there's alpha, which is like a more uh, receptive, calmer state. Like if you're reading a book at night when you're falling asleep. Yeah. Below that is theta, yeah. just as you're falling asleep, just as you're waking up. Yeah. And it's associated with uh, greater creativity, um, you know, uh, super learning. Um, lucid dreaming. Lucid believe. dreaming, yeah. all that kind of which stuff. Which I heard that's something a else. A holistic you experience, yes. if you will. Yeah. Um, and then below that is delta, which is the slowest and your unconscious sleep. And the tank kind of like throws you into delta in the beginning like a lot of people oscillate around that kind of conscious waking point yeah and at first the oscillations are large they're, they're up and down up and down so you go all the way down to delta you pass through theta back into beta or alpha and maybe even skim into beta in the beginning but then as you kind of stay in there with multiple floats <coughs> those oscillations get less and less and less and kind of get ho- hovering right along that cusp sure. and then that's the cuffs you want to hang on okay and as in some floats every float's different sometimes you'll like get into that space and just the stars align and you just float in there 
and you're in that zone like the whole time and yeah. it's crazy amazing it's unbelievable it's, un- it's you can't even describe it huh. um but then other times it's a little it's sometimes if you're a little stressed or just it takes a little bit of time to get into it or you're yeah. a little more uncomfortable who knows anything can happen it's always variable but you do get way better at it with a relative consistent practice have, the, have people started to put some science behind the, the what's going on? Yeah, there was a whole wave of research that happened like in the late 70s or 80s and into the early 90s. Okay. So there's a lot of good baseline physiological evidence, sure. uh, primary research that happened. A lot of it at UBC, actually, with Dr. Peter Sudfeld out of the Department of Psychology. He really uh, did a lot of baseline physiolog- physiological measurements as well as um, like things like heart rate, um, hormone levels in the blood, blood pressure, mm-hmm. muscle tension, that kind of stuff, as mm-hmm. well as cognitive tests, as, as well as emotional uh, uh, indicators and stuff like that. And, you know, so there's a good baseline there, but now it's like, let's take it to the next level of application. Yeah. And that's what we're going to start seeing probably within the next two, three, four years. Awesome. There's really good research coming out of that. Awesome. So well, you guys have you guys have done it right. That's for sure. Thanks for setting that one up. We haven't really gone into the depth of floating talk before, but well, I d- and cool. I haven't. Done, I'm being I'm being a little ignorant here because I'm coming into your home without you know. Amen. Yeah, you're re- giving you're giving back a little bit. Reading yeah. up on enough. Uh, oh, I'd oh, like to re- do some more research and, and learn about it. And again, what we were talking about before the podcast is only so much time in a day. <laughs> that's true. Sure. That's so much, so true. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Well, just come float and relax and feel good. I know. Yeah. Well, you know, you're welcome anytime. So. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I appreciate I, that. I think some of the athletes. I think what might be a barrier to some of them would be like uh, just being still for that long. So many athletes are just so in their body and want to be active and moving and doing for sure. all the time. So the challenge for them is just being still for yeah. that amount of time yeah. and definitely that's his own discipline. But yeah. I think they could fall into it. If they apply the same rigor and discipline to floating essentially yeah. that they do to their training regimes, they'll I think they could master very quickly. Yeah. Actually. And I think the higher level athletes understand the importance of rest nowadays. Um, I think it's getting better. Uh, yeah. like uh, like we when we were in university it, it was we would play hard, we would we would play hard, we worked hard, we partied hard, yeah. and we would, would have Sunday to kind of get rid of our soreness and hangovers with maybe a pool workout. But nowadays, it's so different. Totally. Uh, you know, the, the rest recovery aspect of training is so important that something like this um, can put you ahead on so many levels yeah. of your competition. Yeah. It, uh, yeah, I, ho- I hope some. I hope you guys get some more athletes out here because I think cool. they'll see the benefits really quickly. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. no, it's uh, we don't see a ton yet. I think this is the odd one. A lot of martial artists, more MMA yeah. guys. Uh, really? Yeah. Because of Rogan. do you think that's because Rogan? Oh yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Um, so they're probably the most consistent athletes to come in, or like the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu specifically MMA guys. After that, yeah, um, and then. Uh, yeah, really. Um, it really ball, hasn't hit mainstream sports. No, sports hasn't got into it yet. Mm. Yeah. Arts, arts are more into it, I say, than sports, like uh, the visual arts and things like that. Sure. Music, um, painting. I can understand that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like it, it makes sense for, for, um, for now, but once is the, the, the practical. Yeah. But a lot of yogis. A lot yeah. of yogis. Yogis are, yo- it's a very great connection between yoga and floating because yogis do this big physical activity and then lie in that savasana and sometimes when you lie in that savasana that quartz pose at the end of class Mm -hmm. you just you get really relaxed yeah and that's basically what's happening in the tank but um you know that's why like coupling it with a yoga practice and then coming here right after Mm -hmm. like don't even shower come here shower go in the tank it's like a super savasana you can go really deep into it i bet and that's that's when we had the tank in my apartment i did that all the time yeah and it was awesome yeah no kidding well the yogis and also the psychonauts and that would be a more uh niche demographic i'd say but the people who go out there and uh you know they're drinking shamanic brews in, in in the jungle or they're exploring their consciousness in different ways though, with, with psilocybin yeah, or sure. other yeah, things. I mean, so those types are, are one of our most positive like demographics. They all love it. Yeah. You know? And it's very comparable to an experience like that. Well, if the focus yeah. is looking for and an, an looking within yourself to, f- to connect yourself with yourself. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I get it. It's very introspective. And that's the thing. And that makes a, sense, and right? A, and a lot of, yeah. And a lot of like psychedelics is a very introspective experience. Like you're, yeah. you're taking that thing and you're becoming, it's like taking like a, a clarity pill about your life or an mm-hmm. honesty pill. Mm-hmm. And you're looking at yourself and you're saying, oh, this is how I'm living. This is what I'm doing. And 
I could be doing a lot better in these different areas of my life. And, and you get a lot of that kind of experience in the tank. It depends on the individual. Yeah. You know, some people will have, go in and have a deep, profound experience. And then other people will come out and be like, I was bored, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, and, it's yeah. just, and you got to you got a question. If you're asking yourself why you're why are you bored, you're bored with your own mind. Like you can't you can't be alone with your thoughts for more than 20 minutes without you kind of going crazy. You know, it, it gives you a hard look at yourself, and I yeah. think that's a huge thing that we're missing, or a lot of people are missing. Anyway, well, I think yeah. uh, even more so with the younger generations that are coming up. I bought a McLean's magazine at the airport on the way here. I didn't read the article yet, but uh, the title said, and, and, and I'm not reading this exactly correctly, if I remember. Um, the, the 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 true danger of our teenagers the brain is actually shrinking because of different outside factors because of uh, too much um, fake stimulus, stimulus uh, yeah. parenting mm. uh, education Whoa. systems like it was it was a quite it sounds like it's going to be an all encompassing article Interesting. of of the dangers i'd be very very curious to see uh, if there was something similar in the 70s i think Every generation probably goes through something like this. You know, our grandparents looked at us being like those. those well, every, every older generation loves, loves the shit on the generation underneath them. Yeah, but because you know. <laughs> it's a little different and yeah, and, yeah. yeah. and uh, but, but and it's true though. Like, we've never really seen a generation that's been uh, so hardwired into technology. You know, oh, like, God. Th- these ones, have, uh, these kids coming up and been born into the internet. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And when we we kind of got it, like we first. Started, Toying around there, like in '93, maybe mm-hmm. I don't know when it was. Yeah, no, it's and, definitely uh, sometime in high school for me. High when school, I started poking around. Sure. Now these kids are. This is their normal. This is their normal. And they're going up with this crazy web of information. You're turning on this smartphone. And it's like a portal into an entirely different universe, and you can ask it any question you want and get an answer. What the fuck is that? Like, well, how does that even exist? Well, here's here's we were out for sushi the other night, and we're all in our 30s, and I challenge you to grab a piece of paper. And write in script the alphabet, small letters and capitals. Oh, I can do it. Could you do it? Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't want to take that challenge. Uh, not at all. I love it. <laughs> Mike, go for it. Okay, you remember right what, is, remember, what, remember what a small Z looks like? Oh yeah. Well, oh, yeah. dude, my last name is Zaramba. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah that's, well, that's a gimme. Yeah. That's a gimme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. We we had a, we had to collaborate on a few of them. Really? Eh? Mm. Yeah. No, I think I could do it. I'm pretty good. I mean, you're right. I might because I do and a lot handwriting of handwriting or print or like text. Handwriting. Print. Handwriting. Oh, yeah. Print. Handwriting. Printing. Word. <laughs> printing. We're in a whole other level of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> we well, can't. my Andy handwriting. You printing. And he's like, yeah, printing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the handwriting, yeah. I, I try to handwrite sometimes, and I, I get stuck. I'm like, how do you make that letter again? I just remember Billy Madison when he's writing the Z's. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it be it's a tough too one many for some loops, people. You know, there's too many, <laughs> yeah. too many jokes. zags. And which way does it yeah. go? I don't know. Too hard. Yeah, yeah it's um, weird. Yeah, 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 we played football for a long time. <laughs> yeah. in the head a lot, so <laughs> that might explain some of that. Not me. Yeah. Yeah. Not me. I, I got hit in the head maybe like <clears throat> once a season. It's great. It, isn't it funny when we used to talk about the difference between offensive linemen and quarterbacks? And you guys are out there and you're dropping back and you're like. <laughs> Yeah, Slinging in the pig skin. Nice catch. And you guys we're are just foam, foaming at the mouth, <laughs> just trying to rip each other's faces off on the you line. You dogs, yeah. dick in the dirt, hit the sled, you're nothing. You're <laughs> hey, nice catch, Conrad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, you got to. That's fun. We were I love finesse. It. We were finesse. We, were, yeah. we had the touch. You have to you be. I mean? You just prance out. They were like a deer. Yeah. yeah. Boom. Well, hey. I don't know what. We're, we're the hogs, you know. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, like you we were talking about, it's we're, we've come full circle now. So it's we started with the football. We can you know finish it with it. But it's like the the you need you need the different body types. You need the different personalities. You need the different people to have that all encompassing mm. team. To have that that structure that you need to go out and and and, and execute the jobs that you're told to do. Yeah, and yeah. this is for any ladies out there. If you want like a really quality man, go for an offensive lineman. They're big. But on the inside, there's soft teddy bears. Soft teddy bears, yeah. 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 And they're gentle giants, really. And they'll lead all of, like, any, like, you can have, you know. Stay with the you linebackers. Order the full you don't want linebackers or fullbacks. You can order the full rack of ribs and not feel that you're going to waste food because that old line oh, it'll will be, gone. be there to Guaranteed. help you out. Yeah, even <laughs> still. <laughs> cool. All right, buddy. Let's wrap it up. Thank sure. you so much for coming, man. That was fun. And uh, floathouse.ca for any of your flotation needs. And, um, yeah, we'll see you next time. Think, and I was going to say thanks for coming again, but that's just getting redundant. So, yeah, well, 
Stay to whatever classy. We'll have to, we'll have to do it stay again. Stay classy. We say, you, we say to whatever is. To whatever is. To whatever is. There you go. There you go. That's it. See you next time. Yep. Ciao. <laughs> nice.